uh, like everyone else, I'm very uh, pleased to be here today. I'm glad it's finally happened. Um, in this paper, I will examine the history of the Greek philological syllogos of Constantinople during the Allied occupation. Um, just to give its Greek name, uh, O en Constantinopoli Hellenikos Philologikos Syllogos, and in Turkish sources most frequently uh, cited as the Der Sadet Rum Edebie Gemietu. Um, my aim is to clarify why the Kemalist authorities forced the Syllogos to shut down in 1923, abruptly ending more than 60 years of distinguished scholarly work in fields ranging from literature, history and archaeology, to education, medicine and law. Like other researchers who, who have engaged with the Syllogos' history, I have been constrained by the limits of the available sources. The Syllogos' periodical and other publications provide fairly complete coverage up to 1912. Thereafter, one is obliged to rely on the patchy evidence derived from newspapers and public and private archives in Greece and Great Britain. The insights which many hope to emerge from hitherto untapped Turkish archival sources have recently proven to be disappointing. The Syllogos was established in 1861 by 90 representatives of the Greek bourgeoisie of Constantinople. Their association, aimed at the study and promotion of literature, was based on Western European models. The fact that many of the Syllogos' members were teachers provided it with a natural inclination towards more practical educational matters, including the funding and foundation of schools. By the beginning of the 1870s, it had managed to sideline the Patriarchate of Constantinople, the traditional educational authority of the Greek Orthodox Millet. Although its educational role and influence diminished somewhat after a power struggle with the Patriarchate during the 1880s, it retra retained a strong interest in the area until the end of its existence. From the outset, the Syllogos strictly and prudently adhered to the article of its governing regulations which expressly forbade political and religious discussions of any kind. Recent scholarly work has shed light on the grey legal area within which corporate bodies like the Syllogos functioned in the late Ottoman and Republican periods. An imperial irade issued at the time of its foundation seems to provide the Syllogos with a certain degree of official recognition. This document was probably destroyed in the Para fire of 1870, and it seems unlikely that a replacement was issued. Whatever the case, the Syllogos remained vulnerable to the whims of Ottoman officials, such as when it was ordered to cancel the international conference planned to coincide with its 25th anniversary in 1886. It was only in 1909, when the Ottoman government passed a law permitting the establishment of associations, that the right to exist of the Syllogos and other similar organizations was enshrined in imperial legislation. The lack of clarity surrounding property ownership by corporate bodies was also an ongoing issue for the Syllogos. In 1910, it was presented with a bill for 40 years of unpaid property taxes, an enormous sum well beyond the limits of its resources. Some of its furniture was actually, actually removed by bailiffs and the specter of the confiscation of its headquarters loomed on the horizon. After several anxious weeks, the issue was resolved following the intercession of the Patriarchate, which prevailed upon the government to recognize the Syllogos' tax-exempt status as a philanthropic institution. In gratitude, the Grand Vizier Ibrahim Hakri Pasha was elected to honorary membership of the Syllogos. On being presented with his diploma, he responded with a charming speech, alluding to his admiration for the Syllogos and referring to it as, quote, the oldest learned association in the empire. Regardless of Haki Pasha's praise and the influential connections of many of its members, the uncertainty continued. In 1911, the celebrations planned to mark the Syllogos' 50th anniversary were called off at the very last minute. Although the exact reasons for the cancellations remain ob obscure, it may have been related to intermittent anti-Greek pressure tactics, which followed the de facto annexation of Crete by Greece in 1908. The outbreak of the Balkan Wars and World War I only made matters worse. Although it is known that the Syllogos carried on with its usual cultural and educational endeavors well into 1915, only a few traces of its activity during the latter part of World War I have been preserved. 
Even the very names of the members of its governing council have been lost. In the spring of 1918, Minas Afendopoulos, a secondary school principal, was elected to the first of four consecutive terms as president of, of the Silagos. Under his aegis, the Silagos slowly began to resume its normal cultural and scientific programs. However, following the signing of the armistice, many of its leading members were carried away by what many viewed as the imminent realization of the Megali Idea, the political concept which called for the union of, Greek or, of the Greek Orthodox inhabitants of the Ottoman Empire with their brethren in the Greek state. Some members had a previous history of engaging in Greek nationalist activities on a personal basis, but any scruples they may have entertained about dragging the neutral syllogos into the political arena were swept away by the encouragement, both overt and covert, of Greek diplomatic and military personnel who arrived in Constantinople with the other allied missions. The lifting of strict press censorship greatly facilitated this phenomenon, given that the majority of the Greek language newspapers of Constantinople belonged to or were edited by members of the Silagos. Over the next four years, all but one of these newspapers became mouthpieces for the political views and the expansionist policies of Eleftherios Venizelos, the liberal prime minister of Greece who had brought the country into World War I on the Allied side. Um, so, in December 1918, the post of lifetime president of the Silagos was bestowed upon Venizelos. During the accompanying celebrations, Minas Afthandopoulos delivered the first of many effusive speeches about the Greek Prime Minister. In February 1919, Afthandopoulos signed an open letter, openly aimed at the Silagos' members and supporters, but in reality at the aimed at the delegates of the Paris Peace Conference, supporting Greece's irredentist claims on Ottoman territory. A month later, Afthandopoulos spoke at a Constantinople dinner in honor of the Commander-in-Chief of the Greek Army. These forays into the political sphere by the Silagos were completely without precedent, and it goes without saying that the occupation of Smyrna by Greek forces in May 1919, the overt imposition of the Allied occupation in March 1920, and the signing of the Treaty of Sèvres in August 1920, all greatly encouraged its continuing politicization. In March 1921, the Silagos staged an event celebrating the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the Greek Revolution, something which would have been unthinkable before 1918. Following Venizelos' surprise defeat in the Greek elections of November 1920, his supporters in Constantinople convened a meeting of community leaders and private citizens at the Silagos' headquarters, during which they formed a so-called Committee of National Defense, aimed at restoring their idol Venizelos to power. The committee composed a resolution pledging its support to Venizelos in almost hysterical terms, and it deposited it at the Silagos to allow as many members of the public as possible to add their signature. A few days later, the Silagos' headquarters served as the venue for a further meeting, at which those present composed a letter addressed to the new government in Greece, protesting at the possible reinstatement of the former King Constantine, who had been neutral and deposed by the Allies so that Greece would enter on their side. Um, the Silagos' complicity in these events, tacit or otherwise, is all the more shocking when one considers that when its regulations were renewed at the end of 1919, early 1920 by the new calendar, they retained the article forbidding political activity. It was inevitable that the Silagos was eventually drawn into the emerging, emerging conflict between those who blindly supported Venizelos' policies and those who counseled a more cautious approach, given that he was no longer in power. This matter came to a head at the beginning of 1922, when Venizelos activists in Constantinople stirred up a storm of protest about the content of speeches delivered from the Silagos' rostrum. Their anger was first provoked by Odysseus Andreadis, a distinguished member of the Silagos, who neglected to mention Venizelos' name in a speech about the Migali Idea. When the Silagos then announced that it would not, be in, uh, not allow uh, a popular Venizelos journalist by the name of Kostas Misailidis to continue his provocative lecture series on the conflict in Anatolia, the situation began spiraling out of control. 
The Governing Council's firm stance, and in particular that of Minas Afthendopoulos, strongly suggests that a more conservative element within the Syllagos had belatedly realized that repeated forays into the political arena were bound to have serious repercussions. The unpleasantness of the Misailidis affair probably influenced Athendopoulos' decision not to run for a fifth term of office as president of the Syllagos. His successor, Athanasios Ioannou, also a school principal, was elected during the spring of 1922 as the situation in Anatolia entered its most acute phase. During the Syllagos' usual summer recess, the Greek army in Anatolia was decisively defeated, and in September, the Turkish nationalist forces occupied Smyrna. Athanasios Ioannou and thousands of Constantinopolitan Greeks like him, tainted by their association with Greek nationalism and Venezuelism, fled to Greece to escape punishment at the hands of the triumphant Kemalists. Dimitrios Varsamis, the senior vice president of the Syllagos, stepped into the breach. During his tenure of office, the Lausanne Peace Conference opened and the initial discussions about the future of the Greek community of Constantinople took place. Fears that it would be included in the massive population exchange already underway between Greece and Turkey proved unfounded. However, one of the earliest demands put forward by the Turkish delegation at Lausanne was the removal from Constantinople of associations which had adopted a hostile stance towards Turkey during the war. It is not known if the Syllagos was explicitly included in this ban, but it seems likely. In the aftermath of these upheavals, the Syllagos attempted to function as normal. Elections for a new governing council were held in the spring of 1923, and Ioannis Papadopoulos, a Byzantinist, was elected president. But before the Syllagos could take set, uh, tentative steps to adjust to the new order, the Beolu police sealed off its headquarters and withdrew its permission to function. Papadopoulos and the other members of the governing council were obliged to sign a memorandum stating that Syllagos was being shut down because it had violated the terms of its governmentally approved regulations. They complied, but only after adding a caveat rejecting the accusation. Over the following months, they were repeatedly interrogated by the police, but in the end, no formal charges were laid. In July, the Treaty of Lausanne was signed, sealing the fate of what was now recognized as the non-exchangeable Greek Orthodox minority of Istanbul. At the beginning of October, the Allied occupation came to an end and the Republican armed forces entered the city. Over the preceding 12 months, the Greek population of Greater Istanbul had halved to about 200,000, and the number continued to drop precipitately. The Syllagos' headquarters remained sealed until April 1924, when the building and its contents were handed over to the Kemalist People's Party, the Halk Partisi. The governing council immediately protested to the chief of police, the governor of Istanbul, and the prime minister Ismet Inonu. Official notarized demands that the property be returned to its rightful owners were ignored, and in September 1925, the governing council learned that the Syllagos' large library and collection of manuscripts, coins, and scientific instruments had been taken to an unknown, lo unknown location. Further appeals to the Turkish and Greek governments proved to be in vain. Ismet Inonu informed the governing council that the treatment meted out to the Syllagos accorded with the terms of the third and 14th articles of the 1909 law concerning associations, which banned organizations hostile to the interests of the Turkish state and permitted the confiscation of their property. Although the governing council continued to demand restitution of the Syllagos' property and right to function well into the 1930s, the end had come. The legality of the closure of the Syllagos and the confiscation of its property remains open to question, but is beyond the scope of this paper. In closing, I will instead focus on the fate of the main players um, in the period of its fall from grace. Uh, Minas Ofthendopoulos had presided over the Syllagos during the four years in which Greek nationalism and Venezuela's propaganda had dominated its activity. However, his role in the Andreadis and Misailidis affairs suggests that even in the end, even his enthusiastic Venezuelism seems to have, been, have given way to misgivings about the path the Syllagos was taking. Whatever the case, unlike Athanasios Ioannou, his successor as president, Afthendopoulos did not flee to Greece in the summer of 1922. 
Rather, he remained in Istanbul until his death a decade later, one of the approximately 75,000 Greeks of Istanbul granted non-exchangeable status by the Treaty of Lausanne. Dimitrios Varsamis, who remained in Istanbul, also remained in Istanbul for the rest of his life, succeeding to the vacant presidency of the Silagos after the emigration of Papadopoulos in 1926. Ironically, Varsamis was a Hellenic national, one of the 25,000 allowed to remain in Istanbul in accordance with the Lausanne Treaty. Many other prominent members of the Silagos, deeply implicated in the nationalist excesses of 1918 to 1920, also fled to Greece in 1922, fearing punishment at the hands of the new regime. Those who left Turkey without travel documents issued by the Republican authorities remained in a stateless limbo for several years. In 1930, their hopes of returning to Istanbul and reclaiming their livelihoods were dashed by the signing of the Ankara Convention between Greece and Turkey. This agreement, which settled a number of complicated issues arising from the Treaty of Lausanne, explicitly forbade the so-called fugitives from returning to their city of origin. For more than half a century, the Silagos had successfully responded to a series of challenges, some of which had threatened its very existence. Most, but by no means all, arose from misunderstandings and suspicions on the part of the Ottoman authorities. But it was the imposition of the Allied occupation of Constantinople that gave rise to the most serious challenge of all, how to respond to the rise of a swiftly accelerating and stridently irredentist Greek nationalist movement led by Venezuelist activists within Constantinople itself. The evidence suggests the Silagos, the most pre prestigious and influential Ottoman Greek learned association, was in effect hijacked by a group of its own members who played leading roles within the Constantinopolitan Greek nationalist movement. This was almost certainly against the wishes of a smaller but more conservative faction, which was unable to maintain the Silagos' neutrality and its abstention from political involvement. Observing the Silagos' activity between 1918 and 1922, from the vantage point of historical hindsight, can be likened to watching a train wreck in slow motion. The momentum of the Silagos' engagement with the Greek nationalist and Venezuelist movements was such that any belated resistance from within was rendered, rendered utterly ineffectual, leaving it open to the harshest possible punishment at the hands of the new regime. Thank you.